never, ever buy a sleeping bag from a homeless person. <laughs> These were the words that I uttered to my English, very well-educated friend as we were packing for our trip. He said, Tony, it cost me just $5. It's fine. And the two of us were getting ready to go to Eastern Europe. Our mission? Just get as far into Eastern Europe as possible with the little money that we had. We were looking for an adventure. On our way to the, uh, to the ferry terminal in Hull, I said, John, you know, this thing's, this thing's a deal. You know, you got it for 90 pounds. I'm, I'm impressed. He says, right, just as long as we remember to get the exhaust first. We had no idea what we were getting into. Arrival in Rotterdam, Holland was fantastic. The colors, the textures, I was invigorated. John was having a great time as well. We started our trip. Arrival back to the van that night, that very first night, our moods changed considerably. The locks had been picked, and we'd been ransacked. We'd been in the country for 12 hours, and we'd already been broken into. And I got whittling around, and I thought, I saw, the, oh man, my passport's gone. And I was livid. I was like, what? How is this possible? We've been on this trip for just a half a day. My passport's already stolen. But John calmed me down, you know, ever the calm, kind of meditative person he was. He said, Tony, just, just take it easy. It's going to be fine. He said, while you're traveling with me, you're going to have to learn to keep what's important to you close to you. And that statement, well, it sort of, sort of resonated with me. Keep what's important to you close. And driving one day on the way up to Norway, I said, John, look, it's getting kind of ridiculous, this exhaust. If we don't get this exhaust fixed before this 90-pound van breaks down, I'm just going to lug it with me on the rest of the trip. We got separated in Oslo, Norway for 10 days. And we kept in touch by this wonderful thing called email. Right? Back in 1999, it actually wasn't so uncommon for everyone not to own a cell phone. And neither of us had a cell phone on this trip. So when we were split up, we used that old dial-up internet. Do you remember the internet with that sound, that, that awful sound? You were sitting in an internet cafe just hoping you'd actually get online. We finally got reunited, but unfortunately the van didn't reunite with us. John looked up at me with a cheeky smile and he said, All right, Tony, remember when you said you were going to leave the, uh, bring the exhaust with us if uh, the van broke down? So I brought this uncomfortable one meter long hunk of metal along with me for the rest of our little journey. We finally got to our destination where we could sit on the beach and drink extremely cheap beers, but we couldn't even afford a single beer. We could hardly even afford a meal. Here we are in Romania. We're just about at the Black Sea. We can't afford a beer. What are we going to do for food? How are we going to travel? And again, John, ever the optimist, says, oh, man, don't worry about it. We'll just have to get some jobs. Where are we going to get jobs? He said, in Greece. And that was our next destination. Has anybody been here been to Greece before? A lot of people. That yeah, wouldn't have to cry. Fantastic. We're all very lucky people. We juggled on the beaches, we got jobs at this campground, so we were fed, we had shelter, we even had a few dollars for some beers. It was great. But, the summer started to wind down, the tourist season started to wind down, and we had to move on. But things didn't really work out very well for us in Tel Aviv, as my backpack got stolen. Again, I was furious, I said, John, I'm going to lose it, man. Like, what are we doing on this trip anyhow? And he said, Tony, don't worry about it. Listen, do you still have your wallet and your passport? He said, yeah, they're in my pocket. He said, well, what about your camera? He said, yeah, I've got that in my little pouch, too. He's like, well, what, what else do you need? And after thinking about it for a second, I realized, well, yeah, actually, I've learned to keep what was important close to me. So through all the ups and downs of this trip, there's, there's one thing I have to say that remained constant, and that was the juggling. At the beginning of the trip, John introduced me to this art form, and it would come in really, really handy for us because soon after we arrived to Jerusalem, because we couldn't get jobs in Tel Aviv, John got extremely sick. So now all summer he'd taken really, really good care of me, and it was my turn to take care of him. How are we going to eat? Of course, the answer was, I was going to have to juggle. At that time, at a young age of 23, I was quite nervous about performing. And I really didn't think I could do it. But we'd been juggling together all summer, every day, sometimes six hours a day. So I just got myself out there and tried it. Do you know what happened? It worked. And it started to feel kind of like we were going to hang out there for a while. 
Until this one time I got back to the camp and I saw John laid out there looking whiter than usual. And I said, John, are you okay? He said, Tony, I need to go home. So the very next day I went back into town and I continued juggling. And I spoke to people in our community. So I had the misfortune of going back to our SWAT and explaining to John, man, I'm sorry, I don't know what we're going to do. What are we going to do? He said, just keep trying. So the next day, sure enough, I held my chin up and I got into Old Town Jerusalem, gorgeous cobblestone roads, and I started juggling again. And who would cross my path but this juggler who we'd met very briefly when we were getting robbed in Tel Aviv. <laughs> I threw down my juggling equipment and I said, Ryan, man, how are you doing? What are you doing in Jerusalem? He said, oh, I'm just traveling around like you guys. I said, look, I'm in a real predicament. My friend's really sick. I've got to get him back to England. Can you help me out? He said, Tony, I put his hand on my shoulder, sort of like a father figure. I said, Tony, you and John have learned a lot about each other this summer, haven't you? I said, yeah, absolutely. I said, you're really, really good friends, aren't you? I said, yeah, man, he's like my brother. I said, you respect that friendship, don't you? I've just come into a little bit of money, and it would be my pleasure to pay for your plane tickets home. There was just this really, really wonderful feeling of camaraderie, just one person helping out another person. And in fact, the next day, we were on a flight back to England. And if you could have seen us coming up the walkway towards the customs, the customs desk at Heathrow Airport, you would have also seen me carrying, not a backpack, but this ridiculous <laughs> hunk of metal up to the customs counter. There was some discussion over that, and whether or not we could actually get into the country, but eventually they let us in. First of all, we learned on this trip, you know, the generosity and the kindness of humanity can never, never be overestimated. And the next thing I'd like to remember is about friendship. The friendship that this friend and I created over this trip has led to a spectacular friendship that we maintain today, 13 years later. Keep what's important to you close to you. It's important to maintain those friendships. Do you have someone in the back of your mind who you've been meaning to call to say, hey, just, just to get in touch with Take advantage of today's technology, like Skype or Google Chat. Just get in touch. You don't have to make a big deal out of it. Just connect.